so Lisa, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, it's nice to see you. Nice to uh, see you. My pleasure to be here. Uh, we worked together a long time ago on, uh, I think it was Three Amigos and Spies Like Us. Yes, uh, yes. Good old days when they made a lot of comedies. But you're working on a, a, an awesome film. You're working on Peter Pan and Wendy for Disney, and um, that's very exciting. But what I want to start out by asking you is, what sparked your interest in becoming a film editor? The editing was a byproduct of just being introduced when I was in college for the first time as to what people did behind the scenes. I was uh, spending my junior year abroad in New York and my brother-in-law was going to NYU film school and he used my apartment as a location. And it was the first time I ever saw what people actually did. So that was in college and I was like, okay, I think I might want to pursue this because I had no idea what I was going to do with an English degree. Uh, <laughs> so when I graduated, I moved to New York and ended up getting a job through a friend of the family in a documentary house. And they did industrials, uh, small documentaries, government, government sponsored films. And I was supposed to sit in the front you know, at the front desk and greet people when they came in. But I conveniently found myself answering the phone in the editing room because that's the only thing that they had there. And there was a, there were a couple of editors who were really happy to have me sort trims, 16 millimeter. And uh, I was ecstatic um, because the, that was sort of the idea of being in a library and all this sense of order. So I started to get an idea of what it was. And that job was only for a limited amount of time. And I had just qualified for unemployment. So I was getting $80 a week and had found this wonderful apartment in New York for $162 a month, fifth floor wow. walk up in what wasn't quite Chelsea then, and uh, shared it, a studio with a friend. So uh, $80 a week, I was able to afford my apartment and do that thing, which unfortunately we all have done is I started to work for free and to volunteer yeah. my services. And um, as an ex-president of the union and now still um, on the board, I don't like saying that, but I also do tell young people that you need to gain the skills in order to offer your services. And so right. at that time, the only way was to, you'd walk around and there were a couple of editing buildings and you had your resume and you dropped them off. And sometimes people called, but Another lucky thing, my brother-in-law having gone to NYU, he had become friends with Susan Morse, otherwise known as Sandy, who was Woody Allen's editor for 20 years. And she was just starting her career as an editor. She knew very quickly that she didn't want to spend years in the trenches as an assistant. And so her mentor was Ralph Rosenblum. And he got her a job doing a small documentary and she hired me as her assistant. And I was working on 16 millimeter. We worked in a broom closet at Tadeo. <laughs> they, um, they moved out and she put in her steam beck and there was a, um, a table, you know, rewind table, a bench. And um, there were a couple of uh, feature films that were there on the floor. And I just looked longingly at that 35 millimeter film compared to my <laughs> 60 millimeter film. So we did that. And then Sandy ended up getting a job as the first assistant on the Warriors when it came to New York to shoot. And again, it was a very odd series of circumstances. She couldn't hire me right away because it was a film that was shooting in New York but was going back to LA. So for the second assistant, they hired a woman who had a union card in both places, which was highly unusual. This is 1978, highly, right. highly unusual. 
And right. There were two. There were two separate unions back correct. then. Correct. And it was very easy to get into the union in New York. All you had to do was get a job on a union film and work for thirty days, and you were allowed to join. So wow. they were shooting A and B camera, uh, which was unusual at that time. And there was a lot of film and the editor did not have a tremendous amount of experience. And he immediately bumped Sandy up to become a second editor. So that was a dream wow. for her. And wow. so she hired me as the apprentice baptism by fire. Just, I, it was my second real job and I was working on a Hollywood feature in New York and the organization of the film, was, it was being uh, cut on a chem. Most films in New York were being cut on moviolas. And the way that people, you'll appreciate this, Larry, because it just, young people will not understand this. My um, Sandy had never worked on a, really on a feature on a flatbed. And so her thing was you sunk the dailies and then you coated them rather right. than break them down, rearrange them into cam rolls and then coating them. So right. we, and this was with the coating system, AA1000, AA2000. The old machines. <laughs> so we did that. Um, we sunk the dailies. We would code them. I would break them down and rearrange them into cam rolls. So the only person who could find a piece of film and reconstitute it was me. <laughs> I ended up being indispensable <laughs> for that. Absolutely. <laughs> and they ended up bringing me to Los Angeles. The producers said to David, the editor, what do you need to get this movie done? Because they were trying to get it done quickly because there was another gang film called The Wanderers that was coming out. And David right. actually said to the producers, you have to bring Lisa to California. So they did. Um, wow. I probably didn't get per diem. I didn't get anything. I was just, I was 23 years old and I was going to Los Angeles for the very first time. I had never been to California. I carried the, I carried the line script on the, on the, on the plane and was busy trying to organize it. Uh, Paul Hager pulled me into his office and said, you have to promise to not to try to get into the union. Uh, I went, hmm. hmm. The second editor in California, a man named Freeman Davies, called the union every week and found out about the availability list. And at one point, the availab availability list went down to five people and they said, okay, you can bring your person in. So oh, I got into wow. the New York local and the LA local on one film, sort of achieved the impossible because it was so difficult to get into the LA local at that time. I mean, it was so difficult. Wow. And you were born under a lucky star, girl. That That's amazing. I, I mean, that just didn't happen back in those that days. That was my first... That was my first film. <laughs> I lived, ate, breathed, died it. And actually, yeah. occasionally, Walter Hill and I still exchange emails. And oh. there, was a mar there was a road race in New York recently called The Warriors. And it went from the Bronx down to Coney Island. So I sent him the article. And we keep saying every time I went to, uh, there was a retrospective of Walter's work at the Arrow a few years ago. I went to the screening. James Remar, who played Ajax, was there. I got a photo of everybody. It's just, you know, who knew we were working on a classic? <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and to be able to get in the union on that and, you know, one of your first films. Really exciting stuff. But, uh, you know, when you when you talked about walking into the editing room that first time and seeing those trims and stuff, you, you know, I remember just just the feeling of excitement, you know, just like this is such a different thing than I've ever seen. And what are these people doing at these machines? And it's like, you know, if you have that excitement when you walk into one of those rooms, uh, y you know, you know that you might be destined to, you know, do something in this craft. Because if you don't get that, you're definitely, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good indicator that this ain't for you. But, but, you know, I don't know what it is. It's that combination of machinery and creativity the pictures and the and the gears that that kind of really you know sparked my excitement about 
film editing. Uh huh. I agree with you. Um, I tell people you know quite quickly whether or not you can handle being in an editing room because it, you know, a lot of people just need sort of more the excitement of the set. Uh, you sure. have to, because otherwise it's really stifling. I was kind of like a duck to water, especially in terms of the organization. Um, just kind of, I could see the forest for the trees, the big picture. That's something that oftentimes you find as an editor, you try to pass down that whole experience to an assistant and sometimes they can't, they get caught in the minutia and they can't see the big picture and the right. process. And that's one of the most wonderful lessons I've learned. Uh, it's a process. Uh, it's uh, from one of the things, especially when you're a young editor and you'll spend an hour on a cut, just you're maybe right. more. It's like, I need sure. to cut it here. It needs to be right here. And <laughs> when you're cutting on a cam, it's like, you know, and you're cutting on film and it's like, as it goes through the machine and right. you sit and you think about it because you're trying to figure out, you don't want to make too many splices. Obviously electronically it's much better, but I've now right. realized in this is, it can't be right there. It has to be before or after <laughs> <And that's laughs> the process. it will all come out in the end. Uh, it's another thing looking at dailies. I know there's some editors who look at every single piece of film really minutely before they start cutting a film. I have, um, I tend to start, I, my, I tend to feel that what I really want to do, the, the most help I can be to the director is to cut the scene as quickly as possible and get it to them. So I read the script notes. I try to get to have a good relationship with script supervisor. I try to get them to talk to the director. I try to get the director to talk to the script supervisor, really give them an idea. Some are better than others. I say, sure. write a note to me, you know, Lisa, this is what we need. This is what we meant by this. You know, I don't really care. It's, I read the notes and then I'll start with the circle takes and I'll start at the last one and go through and just start putting it. The hardest part is always figuring out how to start the scene. You know, that's right. always like, mm, how am I going to do this? What's the first shot? And then you just start going and it's the film starts talking to you and telling you where to go. But, and yeah. I assure the director by the end of the movie, we will have looked at every single frame many, many times <laughs> over. And I really do know that and believe that, that you keep searching and you want to make sure you have the best take. But um, I love hearing this, Lisa. I really do. Because you know what? That is really my same approach. Your process. Because, um, you, you know, I just want to put together a scene, I don't care, I, you know, obviously I'd like it to be as, as wonderful as possible, but I want to have something, a rough cut to spring off of, you know, and then I can start going through the material, but to put something together as quickly as possible is really important for me. And for a long time, I was very self-conscious. Well, I'm not really looking through every single take, you know, sometimes the first three or four takes are garbage anyway, you know, but but I, I really, uh, I, I, I agree with you and I find the value of having something, you know, just a structure to work off of really, you know, it enable it kind of gives me, uh, you, you know, a deep breath and like, okay, this, this is going to work. Right. Now let's make it as good as possible and really, you know, plow through the material. Right. And, 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 and you know, and, and explore you know, the possibilities. So, so yeah. that's really neat. Um, let me ask you a question about your experience as an assistant, because, you know, like me, I mean, I spent 10 years as an assistant, an apprentice, uh, on and off, you know, occasionally I would get a shot at an associate editor credit or what have you. I worked in sound for a while, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. How do you feel that experience uh, informed your work as a film editor? Uh, I mean, did it? Uh, do you oh, think that applied? Massively so. Now, you something that doesn't really happen in today's world, when I was an assistant, oftentimes the editor would have you in the room with them to find the trims that were in the bin. They would hand you a trim and you would put it 
So they didn't have to be bothered by it. Carol Littleton, whom I call my mentor, uh, she liked to work in a solitary way. I would arrange a bin with her and put the code numbers on it. And, you know, she she was willing to take a look at it. But my first editor, he wanted me in the room with him a lot. And so I could watch the thought process of how he sometimes it, I couldn't necessarily do it during the first cut because we just didn't have enough labor and I was busy. You were busy with dailies dailies and And then reconstituting that old fashioned thing. And because of this cockamamie coding system, I was the only one (laughs) who knew where the film went. But when you're in the room with the editor, you silently watch and say, oh, I would add more. I would have more at the head or I would have more at the tail, or I think this is the shot that they're going to go for. And you'd roll down in the reel because remember, you'd have to roll down if you're working on a chem to get it. Unlike a moviola, you had all the, all the things uh, on the, on the bench, Uh, a very sort of different process, but you and editors, would hire assistants as much for their sensibility to be really in sync with them when they were cutting. Um, Mm. So I got the tail end of that. With Carol, I, uh, I often say I used to listen to the radio and then a lot of times I would stop listening to the radio and I would listen to the rhythm of her cutting and I would Mm. really see where she was in the scene and kind of incorporate it. I could just, feel it, understand it. There are a lot of times, uh, especially with dialogue scenes, I'll cut the sound and then plug in the picture because it really has Hmm. to do with the rhythm of the language and the picture almost doesn't matter. It always matters, but but so there are so many different ways to doing it. And also the other big thing is I had the opportunity to go to a lab and watch dailies. So we had... Maybe, you know, if you had an hour and a half, that was a lot. You know, I mean, you really didn't have right. many dailies in those days because people shooting on film, they really had to think about things. Uh, that changed later on. People would do it almost like now, keep rolling. And and being with the director and the DP and the editor, the art director, the makeup people, hearing everybody talk about what was going on, you would, on my first film, I sat in between the, um, I sat next to the director because the editor did not want to take notes himself. So I would be there taking notes about the dailies. So, you know, I became very aware of, I like this take over that take and the reason why. And you start to learn a language. You really have to, because that's one of the things when you start to talk to a director to be articulate about why you like something over one take over another, a cut over another, how it makes you feel what it is. You really have to learn how to communicate in a way that's going to really express your opinion. Um, Right, clearly. So I going to a lab and sitting and watching dailies, as much as I hated it at the end of the day, you're just tired. I can't remember (laughs) if we got paid for it or not. I, you know, I mean, (laughs) that's a... But you just did it because that's what it is. And then they started having dailies at lunchtime. That was never done before. Um, Hmm. And uh, now you don't have dailies at all. Nobody watches dailies anymore. Yeah, it's strange. I mean, and you can't because, you know, you can't sit through five hours of dailies. Uh, You know, uh, what I was starting to say was, you know, it's become a real problem that because we shoot digitally and there's no processing and there's no stock costs, um, they never turn off the camera. And it's really, you know, in my opinion, uh, you know, caused a real, you know, lack of discipline on the set. Now, from their perspective, a lot of time, the actors, they don't want to cut because it breaks the thread for them. So, you know, I get it, but it really makes our job much more labor intensive, uh, requiring bigger teams of assistance. And, you know, a lot of times from what I, you know, had experienced, uh, the studios weren't really kind of getting it uh, at first. You know, they were like, well, you know, why do you need all these extra people? And I'm like, well, because they shot 200 hours of dailies, you know, and, and that was unheard of, you know, 
back back in the day. But we, let me ask you a question we, about we used to do it in film, and Heaven's Gate was the first film that had over a million printed feet of film. Although no Apocalypse probably did. You know, yes, Apocalypse. Did. Those films that were the horror stories that. All the assistants in town knew about. <laughs> but Apocalypse took three years to shoot a million feet of film, you know? Yes. So <laughs> four years. I mean, ago. right, exactly. So, I, I mean, you know, you're dealing with a completely different animal. I mean, again, this film, the last film I did for Netflix had 200 hours of dailies. It was shot in, you know, it was shot in 50 days, 55 days. So. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's a whole different animal. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, somewhat along those lines, I wanted to ask you, you, you know, you were talking about how we used to be in the room with the editor. Mm -hmm. how, how do assistants sort of learn the craft these days? I mean, I think that we're much more siloed in general because of, you know, digital editing, you know, and, 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 and assistants are, uh, you know, sort of saddled with even more, with even more metadata management uh, tasks, um, that's certainly something that we, you know, you know, teach in our in our class. Mm -hmm. um, how do assistants, you know, sort of get that experience? I mean, is it just because it's digital? You can just give them a scene to cut. I mean, how do you well, handle I, it these days? Um, you know, it differs on different films. I remember at the end of Pitch Perfect. Um, I had uh, two assistants and an apprentice. I don't think I did that. And we were getting towards the end and it was a musical and there was a lot of film and there was, uh, I'm pretty good at keeping up to camera, but this was just getting challenging at the end. And at the end I was like, let's all start cutting. Whatever is available, we're all going to wow. cut. And it was actually, it was really fun. Some of the stuff was garbage. Some of the stuff was good. Um, Chris McCaleb, who's going on to incredible fame uh, you know, and, and success with Breaking Bad uh, and that whole team, was one of my people who was brought on. He was brought on because we had, we had a technical issue and they couldn't figure out how to do a playback code and he came in to trick the avid. To, it was great. We ended up with, um, and then I've had, um, I had an assistant, Don Broida, who now directs commercials, but he was an assistant of mine on and off for nine years. And uh, we had the wonderful opportunity. He started out as my apprentice on In Her Shoes on film. I didn't realize until late in the game he was, finishing up college, going to college full time. This was when he, and, but he was doing stuff online and <laughs> working full time. And, wow. um, and then when I, I remember he became my first assistant when I did a pretty low budget film and he had had a little more experience. And again, um, I felt like it was going to be a good match and I gave him stuff to cut. He did a great job. Uh, Philip Bartel, uh, I just had the wonderful opportunity of having lunch with him recently. He's doing a Disney film and uh, Gina Blyer. I give people stuff to do. And Gina, I remember it was on film. And I remember Gina <laughs> did one of those things where every other, every other frame around some of the cuts was a cut mark. <laughs> you just kind of say, here, go to it. And then I bring them in and we talk about it. And I ask them to make changes. Um, every once in a while, it's a real bust. And I'll just take it back and say, you know what, I think I'm going to do this. And then you can look at what I did versus what you did. And that'll be the learning experience. Um, right, right. So well, that's great. But but it, it seems what you're saying is, and I think I think this is a, a really good thing for people to know is, you have to be a little more proactive. It's nice if you'll work with a with an editor who will be proactive and offer you things to cut, but it's also probably a good idea if you sort of, you know, elegantly, you, you know, let your intentions be known because oh, yes. that yes. that system is 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 no longer uh, you know available where we were able to sit behind you know the editor and really kind of absorb in that in that almost you know uh, unspoken way uh, you, you know how to how to 
do our craft. Um, well, that's really great. You know, it's really great to know that you offer people the opportunity to cut. Because I think it's really like the only way to, you know, to get your It is. It is. So if um, there are times when it doesn't quite work out that way, but I tell people, you know, on your own time, if there's nothing to do, please feel free. You can, you know, there's their dailies, practice, play. Yeah. Yeah. It your and way and then see, you know, don't look at what I did and see, see the way that you would do it. Um, and yeah. we can talk about it. Um, yeah. And it's digital. So there's no splice marks. It's right. You know, it's right. It's, it's wonderful in that respect. <laughs> hey, listen, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, and I, and I know that, you know, before, when we talked earlier, you know, you described yourself as not, not really that technical of a person, but, you know, I kind of, and we spoke about this. I, I kind of feel that, you know, you're short selling yourself because if you're a film editor, you're probably more technical than the average person anyway. But I, I wanted to ask, you know, how does you not being a technical sort of oriented editor, um, like manifest in the cutting room. I, I mean, is it just because, you know, at a certain point, I, I kind of stopped doing all of the technical stuff also. And I really kind of just focused on the cutting. Um, I mean, is that, is that basically, is it basically the same thing? I mean, do you just kind of like let your assistants kind of do all the, you know, the plumbing and, 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 you know, obviously the metadata management. That's I, just something. Well, I always wanted to make sure that I never was asked to work without an assistant. So I actually don't know how to get anything into a machine or out of a machine. So I don't know how to get them from the raw stock in, and I don't know how to do an output. I'm not going to say I'm, you know, proud of that, but that's the deal. Um, but that's not your, but that's not your job. I mean, and, and that's, you know, something I, that I, um, I'm technical in that I, you know, when I start a project, I remember assistants would say, what version of Avid do you want to be on? And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> something right. that I don't, if you, you know, whatever you want is fine. You're the one that has to deal with it much more than I do. If there's something that is lost from a previous version, you'll tell me how to do it. Uh, Avid's, you know, somebody will tell me what to do. If something goes wrong, I uh, often will, like, if a message comes up, I always forget, what am I supposed to do? So now I just, I send a photo of it because I have this cutting room, which is kind of <laughs> far away from where my assistants are. So I'll take a picture and I say, what am I supposed to press? Uh, you know, or say, can you come here, right. please? Um, so I just don't, uh, I cut the picture. I will cut sound. I'm a really good dialogue editor. I am very, very good at filling tracks. I hate doing it. and But a lot of times I find that people are not as persnickety about it as I am. Uh, so I will do that kind of thing. Um, as I learned how to, when I got the job Pete's Dragon, my young director asked me if I would be willing to do it on Premiere. And this was, I guess, seven years ago. And Premiere was really not ready to do a big Hollywood you know, studio feature. And right. I did research about it. I really did. And I said to him, you know, it's not quite there, but if we ever do another project, I promise I'll, I'd be happy to learn Premiere. And lo and behold, uh, we did another project together. So Adobe was quite wonderful. They provided me with a tutor and I was pretty comfortable by the time I started and I got an assistant who was very versed. He's actually, um, he learned on Premiere. Uh, and so he quite knowledgeable. And so for the first couple of weeks, it was the same thing when I first learned the Avid. For the first couple of weeks, they have to babysit you a little bit more. But then you're right. fine. You know, once you know the JKLs, you know, forward, stop, reverse, you're right. okay. Um, before... When I learned it was forcing, Premiere is getting better with trim mode. That's probably one of the biggest differences. When you, I use trim mode a lot. 
a right. lot, a lot, a lot. My director, who is now a member of the Editors Guild, uh, is cutting on this movie. Uh, he's been making, directing, and editing films since he was around eight. So it made wow. sense. Uh, and it's really funny because he'll get up to like 10 V layers. He, he like spreads out all over. We have to call it de-Davidifying it. We have to <laughs> bring it back in. Um, and uh, because he doesn't actually really know how to use trim mode. And, right, uh, right, and right. So also, they stack the cuts. He they doesn't stack. make cuts. We were having this conversation with my, uh, he had gone into a reel and my assistants, some, we didn't know if he had done anything. And I said, well, he must not have done anything because there's not any cut in the music. There were cuts in other tracks, but there's no cut in the music. And we're having this interchange texting back and forth and then David finally piped in and said I he does the rolling edits and so the music just rolled and it doesn't cut so it was just it was one of the funnier things that was uh, I was like could you please just cut next time then we'll know that you've been into a <laughs> he's like I'll yeah. try I'll try but you know everybody's got a different way of working so um, yeah. I, yeah. Um, when I learned I actually created my own keyboard I don't have an Avid keyboard I don't have the Premier keyboard my tutor recommended that there was a better in between and so I got a gaming keyboard and I have it all color coded and it's pretty funny. Um, cool. <laughs> and so it was, uh, and then after I finished my premiere show, I went back to an avid show and I was like, Oh my God, am I going to know how to do that? It was like riding a bicycle. And then my next show was a premiere show. Am I going to know how to do it? But it was fine. So, yeah, well that, that's really interesting. I mean, so, are there things that you love about Premiere that, you know, you feel are missing in Avid or things that you hate about Premiere that you wish it had? I mean, well, oh. give me some like, you know, <laughs> so, well, some of your... Um, uh, they've come, when I first did Old Man and the Gun, uh, the first time I went on Premiere, I was like this grid system of the tiles uh, right. fourth side, I was like, this has got to go. You have got right. to change this. You have got to change this. Alan Bell apparently was a um, an advisor for them. He had told them that. It was every avid editor who came in, you've got to change it. I think I complained the loudest, though, and the longest. And um, so... Uh, they in, be in, in, in bin view. So that you can move the tiles, because I group my tiles. I have them touching like all yeah. masters and then Absolutely. You know, it's so it's a visual representation. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yes. How I want to cut the, cut the scene. And it's not just in alphabetical order. It's the wide shots. It's the way, because uh, I started on a chem, it's the wide shots first, and then you change directions and then you go to the tighter shots and, or you keep it all on one character um, yes, I mean I, I I do the same thing. I organize my bins in chem roll order. Yeah, uh, you, you know, and then I can look at it, and it just like makes sense. But in the right. grid view, the way it's designed by a software engineer, it just looks like a bunch of pictures. Oh my god, I was I was just I did do a, one film like that, but I hated it. I mean, I yeah. truly hated it. They heard from me a lot. Um, good, and uh, they changed. This is good. Um, trim mode is um, getting better. Um, yeah. The rollers don't stick the way that they do in Avid. I also use a pen and a tablet, mm -hmm. so they don't stick with that. I've now I now have a um, a mouse because they stick much more when you use the mouse. Uh, there's a wonderful feature on Avid that if you go into trim mode and then go out, you can press. If I'm go back on an app, I'll have a muscle memory. A couple of the things and all the all the rollers will go back on. So if you have twelve rollers, twelve rollers will go back on. Uh, right. We um, when you are working on a 
big feature, Adobe will create features for you. So we now have that feature. Um, nice. So that was a really big deal. Uh, I like yeah. the, there's an intuitiveness with Premiere with moving, moving your shots. That's probably comes more from Final Cut. I love the snapping, <laughs> the beginning and end of cuts. Uh, yeah. And um, there are probably things I, I miss Premiere when I'm not on it, but I miss Avid when I'm not on it also. <laughs> I, I really like I really yeah. like both of them. I'm sure at some point I'll end up having to learn Resolve. Who knows? <laughs> you know? well, we'll see. Uh, yeah, that's maybe. Be the next one. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you bring up good points. That both, both pieces of software have a lot to learn from each other. Right. And, you know, I do think that Avid has kind of, you know, brought on some of the, you know, segment mode, which is, you know, a very Mac interface-like thing, which is is just, you know, sort of organic in Premiere, you know, just dropping shots in and things like that. Right. Um, but, but, you know, you're right. And I think that it's just good for editors to have two robust or as many as possible, really, but two or, you know, Resolve would be three, Final Cut would be four, robust editing tools, mm -hmm. you know, to keep the marketplace healthy and competitive. Um, so, so it, it's a good thing and, and it's exciting that you're doing such a, such a massive film, uh, you, you know, in premiere and, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that you like it. I, you know, I, I actually do quite a bit of cutting in it myself nowadays and, and, and I like it also, but I, but my timelines don't look like any of these timelines that you see. Sometimes they post them on Instagram or something like that. There are these massive, oh. you know, 80 layer, you know, it's like, I like my picture to all be on one so track. Is, um, you know, I tell my visual effects people, I'm only going to have five, five layers. That's it. <laughs> and we use six and seven to bring in new shots. And then we bring them down. I pull them down. The other ones, obviously with sound, uh, you know, it's easy, especially when you're first, if you're in a big action movie, uh, to easily have 16, 20 things. I try to m minimize it. Um, right now we're actually carrying, we did have our first temp dub, so we're carrying the mix. So we have fewer tracks, audio tracks. Um, and I love the, f I love, and I can't remember if you can do this in Avid. I love being able to go hover and go into full frame, of your timeline and then have it small. Hey, let me ask you something. In in terms of like getting into the business these days, what advice do you have, let's say for, you know, for newer people who aspire to become film editors? What's your what's your sort of, you know, sage advice? Well, for somebody in editorial, it's generally uh, production assistance that you're giving this PAs, you're giving this advice to and we get pigeonholed, especially at the beginning of our career. I know that getting in the union, sometimes reality is a really good way to get in. And there is definitely more movement between television, limited series, and films. But if you really want to work in features, which is not the best place to be working these days because there are far fewer of them than limited series and various things, um, you know, really go after that. Uh, try right. to, um, if you're going to be a PA, you're going to, those are the people that you're going to meet. Uh, and those are the people, other assistants are where you're going to ultimately get your first job. Uh, and there's that unfortunate thing that they have to go and work non-union in order to get their days to get in. But, right. um, and then there are a lot of people right now who really are committed to television and that's, you know, so go for that. So I, I say go for the area that you want the most and um, meet as many people as you can. If you're an assistant, that's where you're going to find your uh, – try to create as many relationships with fellow assistants because that's the network who's going to help you. They're going to hear about a job. They're going to recommend you for a job. You know, I mean, I go to my assistant. If a friend of mine comes and says, I need an assistant, I go to my assistant and says, do you know of anybody? Because I don't know anybody. I just know right. my assistants. Um, so it's building that network, maintaining your network, uh, 
and there's a way to do it where you're not in somebody's face, but right. it's so easy to drop a line to somebody. To, um, and you have to put yourself forward, as you mentioned before, you say to your editor when you're an assistant, and I find that a lot of my assistants, when I'm interviewing them, they do say, uh, do you allow your assistants to cut? And I'm always happy when they ask that question because I I like to talk about the film. When I work with, we generally always have lunch together. We watch the film together. I talk about it. I talk about the problems, talk about the politics, try to, at this point, it's trying to pass on any kind of knowledge that I have. And so much of our job is political. So when they're about to do something, I go, no, no, that's not really the person you should be talking to. And that's not the way to present it. You have to think right. about it this way. Um, and I've made many mistakes along the way. I still continue to make mistakes. It's, uh, <laughs> but it's it's all the process. And that's the one thing <laughs> That uh, And I am not the most patient person, but uh, editing and finishing a film, it's a process. And it's yeah. kind of, it teaches you life's lessons. I agree. Yeah. And if you try to rush it, you're going to find yourself unhappy. Right. You know, if, if I, I found earlier on in my career, I would always want to be doing things faster and, and, and sort of forcing the process. And I would find myself, you know, miserable because it just doesn't work that way. You kind of really got to, you really got to be in the moment, be in the zone, really watch the performances, really, you know, absorb the material to, uh, I mean, we all get under the gun and we got to, you know, got to slam things out every once in a while. But, uh, you know, as an overall rule, yeah, that's that's really good advice. Well, listen, Lisa, thank you so much for uh, for speaking with us today. Uh, it's That's it's awesome. so nice to see you. And I wish you the greatest success with uh, Peter Pan and Wendy. I'm sure it's going to be a, a fun movie. And, uh, and 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 I hope to be talking to you soon. Thank you so much for uh, for taking the time. My pleasure.